Hi, uh, thank you, Titus. Good morning, everyone. Could you turn in your Bibles to a new book in the Old Testament? And if you need to use your table of contents, go right ahead. We're going to go uh, to the Old Testament to the book of Obadiah. It's only one chapter long, so it'll take us a couple of months to do this book. And, uh, and for those who are wondering, uh, Obadiah, where it's located, it's after Daniel. Remember we did Daniel? It's after Daniel, it's after Hosea. You have Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah. So it's right after Amos. So it's... Uh, you know where Daniel is? We did Daniel, so it's not too far after that. So Obadiah, and there's only one chapter. And again, like I said, it's probably just going to take us, we'll probably fin this, finish this book sometime in uh, January or February. So, and, um, so we're going to be uh, in this book for a little bit. And then we'll, I haven't decided what we're going to do after we finish Obadiah yet, but that's a ways away. So uh, also in uh, if your songbooks, could you turn your pay, uh, in your songbooks to uh, page 191? We're going to do Word of God Speak, page 191. And um, just a couple announcements before we uh, get underway. We have our Sunday morning offering at the end of class uh, today, as is our custom on Sundays. And those who are internet people, you can uh, hit our website, and there's a P.O. box number that you can, if you want to send something to us. And uh, if you're benefiting from the teaching, or you can use PayPal on the, on the website as well. Our class schedule, for those unfamiliar with us and our ministry, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. We have a prayer meeting after class, corporate prayer meeting, and our internet people can join us through this website. We have a prayer meeting at the end of class on Sunday, and we meet from 9 a.m. to about 10, 15 a.m. on Sundays. And when we have the Lord's Supper, which is the first Sunday of each month, uh, we go to around 10.30 or so. And Jody Thompson puts a, um, a, a brunch on for us after Bill and Crystal contribute here too. Uh, to it, and so uh, if you're uh, in the area, you can get the Word of God and get fed afterwards. And uh, uh, also, um, we were an expository type ministry, so every sermon is different. Our weekday class, we're doing the book of, uh, we're doing First John, a New Testament book on our weekday studies, and now Sunday we're starting a new book. In between books, we usually do uh, different doctrinal subjects. Uh, we did the church in the recent past, we did the Trinity, we did justification, sanctification. Uh, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. We did a whole slew of different doctrines in between books over the years since we've been in Marion, Iowa, which leads me to the other point. Uh, we don't have a street address on our website for our, webs uh, for our ministry because we meet in a home. We meet in the Thompson's home and in Marion, Iowa. Uh, so if you want uh, the, uh, the street address, you can call the phone number on the website, which is actually my personal number. And I'll give you the street address. We don't like to really post their street address out there on the website when uh, it's, a, it's a residence. So if you're interested, uh, you're more than uh, welcome to come on in and join us. So I think that's uh, it for the, um, the, uh, the, what do you call it, the announcements that I have. I don't think I have any more to, uh, to, to give you. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess our sins to the Father. Remember, confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God, and we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Word of God. And when we're doing that, of course, we're obeying the Holy Spirit, who's not only inspired the Scriptures, but He actually speaks to us through the Scriptures, whether it's your own sanctified time in the Word of God, uh, or in prayer, or in, when you're listening to your pastor teach the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is, is, uh, is speaking through uh, the, the pastor and as he accurately interprets the scriptures. And so, um, without further ado, and uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, we all have things that bother us and we're going through different various pressures with family and friends or finances or whatever it is, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. That's 1 Peter 5, 7. So, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this morning in the Thompson home and those who might be joining us through the website live. And uh, we also thank you for those who might be listening in or watching these classes at a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for Tyson and Jody Thompson and opening up their home to us. 
and uh, also the sacrifices that are involved in that, and also Titus's work with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for the talent that you've given him in that area, given wisdom in that area this, this morning, and we pray that we'd have no problems with the sound, the recordings, the video, the audio, and the upload of these things to the website, YouTube, or wherever else where we may put these uh, recordings. We thank you for our, our relationship with you and your son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for identification with your son and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at your right hand. We thank you for the victory that you've given to us through your son and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, victory over sin and Satan, and help us and convict us and encourage us and motivate us to appropriate by faith this identification so that we can experience victory over sin and Satan now in time. We thank you for the fact that we could be... Uh, translated. We could be perfected in a resurrection body, body at any moment. We also know that at any moment we could die. We know that you could take us home, and we know that we have the victory over physical death. Your word states that when we die, we're absent from the body, face to face with your son, Jesus Christ. So help us live in light of the imminency of our death or the rapture, whichever comes first, first so that we might grow to maturity, experience your sanct sanctification, your holiness, and get a full reward at the Bema seat. We pray, Father, that you would help us in this new book in Ob Obadiah. We pray that this study would be a blessing to your people, the church. We pray that you would help me by the power of the Spirit to communicate accurately uh, this book and bring forth your full counsel to your people. We pray that you would use me as your instrument and also use your people mightily as they take, it, take in your word. By the power of the Spirit, help, help them to understand and make application of what's being taught. We also pray that you would help us sing, worship you and your son Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit in music. And we thank you for the gift of music that you've given in our lives. So Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, could you all rise please? Word of God speak. We're going to do page 191. Hey guys, that was quick. The beast that I know 
that you're in this place Please let me stay and rest in your holiness I'm finding myself at long last in words And the funny thing is it's okay Maybe see it. <laughs> He's a trip. <laughs> Bye, Nathan. <laughs> All right, you should be at Obadiah. Obadiah, one chapter in the. Uh, in the Old Testament, one chapter, only one chapter long, this book. You know what Daniel is? If you know what Daniel is, you've got a table of contents in the Old Testament. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if you're very unfamiliar where it is, and it's n not unusual because uh, it's not taught very often. We, don't, we really pass over it many times, and it's an Old Testament book, and there's only one chapter long. You've got Daniel. After Daniel, you have a couple of books, and then you'll see after Amos, uh, there's a, a book called Obadiah. It's one chapter long, and we're going to begin to study this book. Uh, we finished off our series on Christian fellowship, what that is, a 10-part ten, uh, ten series, 10 Sundays we did in that particular subject. Now we're going to go on to an Old Testament book. I try to go uh, from New, Old Testament, New Testament, back and forth, and so we're going to do this book, Obadiah. As I said before, it probably take us a couple of months, probably finish it in January or February next year, Lord willing. And so uh, what we're going to do, before we, have, begin, we, before we begin a study of any book, um, what we do is we do a, an introduction. Some introductions are longer than others, and uh, one of the reasons our, our, this introduction is probably going to take us three weeks, and uh, probably I know it is going to take us three weeks, and the reason why, there's a lot of things in the book that we need to get down, background, that takes some explaining. And because we're so unfamiliar with the book, and even if we were, uh, you know, aware of the book and familiar with it, there's some things that we need to go into uh, that uh, when, uh, when we discuss this particular book. So when we go into a, a book, an Old Testament book, or it's a New Testament book, we do an introduction, and we do the introduction for uh, for, uh, for a couple of reasons. We want to know when we, for interpretive reasons pr primarily, uh, uh, because when we look at a particular book of the Bible, we need to learn, we need to understand some th certain things about the book because these things will be important when we interpret the book, such as, for instance, the authorship. Uh, uh, authorship, it's, uh, we want to know who the author is. Sometimes authorship is very important, sometimes it's not important. Uh, there's uh, the date, uh, the date of the book, because the date's important, because remember in Daniel, uh, we, there are some people who said it's a second century BC production, and he, Daniel's not writing prophecies, but he's writing history. And of course, we said the date, and we, we noted why the date is a sixth century BC production, is because, uh, and we, we went through that, and then that's important because that would mean that Daniel's prophet, the pro these things were prophecies that he was bringing out to us, m much of it, and not. Uh, history. So the date of the book can be very uh, important. Uh, we also are going to talk about the place. Where was it written? Uh, who are the recipients? Who is receiving this particular book? We're going to note that today as well. And here's a very important thing with regards to interpretation. What type of literature is this book? Today we'll see the literary genre of the book at the end of service today. Literary genre means what type of literature is it? Uh, the Bible uh, is just like a lot of books in, in one sense. It's a, un, unlike any other human book written by men and that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it's a divine book. The will of God was behind this, this book. But it's also very much like any other human book in that it was written in human language. And, the, and, and with different with uh, poetry, prophecy, apocalyptic literature, epistles. So every book has its own particular literary genre. It's a certain type of literature. So when we did, do First John during the weekday classes, First John is a letter, we call it an epistle, and actually in a circular letter that was given to a group of Christians in the Roman province of Asia. It's a little bit different than Paul's epistles and, and that it was a circular letter. In a lot of ways it's like Ephesians it, is, it was in Paul's, uh, in, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians. So 
uh, Obadiah, we're going to find out what type of literature that is. When we did Daniel, uh, we saw that Daniel was a prophet, had a prophetic, had history, had a lot of uh, na uh, narrative history, we call it, but it also had a lot of prophecy and apocalyptic literature, a lot of symbolism that speak of real persons and real events, like a lot of Revelation is, chapters 6 through 18, the book of Revelation. So that's very important when you come to interpret a particular book in the Bible. Why? We have to do these things because it helps us interpret it. And you just can't walk into a book and, you know, there's some things you can pick right up about reading the, in the particular book. But there's a lot of things we'd have a greater understanding if we knew these other things that I've been mentioning. The, his, the, uh, the authorship, the date, the place where it was written, the people who he's writing to, the writers writing to, the type of literature it is. We're also going to note the different themes and theology that is in the book of Obadiah. Uh, when we did Zephaniah during our weekday classes a couple of years ago, last year, I can't remember now, it all runs together, but Zephaniah is very much like this book, Obadiah. There's a lot of uh, hist there's history involved, and uh, there's also prophetic literature involved uh, as well in Obadiah. Actually, Obadiah is, uh, contains both. It talks about, uh, it refers back to historical events and uh, in the 6th century BC, and it also talks about the events that will take place in the future. Future to when the, the person wrote this particular book, Obadiah. We'll also note the great theology that's in the book. Uh, we'll talk about God as being the judge of the nations. Uh, this book is going to help us understand how God governs the nations. He's also going to, it's also going to show us uh, the fact that he's sovereign and that he is imminent, that he's involved in the affairs of man, men, and he's actually involved in the affairs of the nations. Most people don't realize that. We also see that God uh, uses uh, various nations as his instrument uh, to uh, bring out or exact or uh, his righteous indignation, his wrath. So, for instance, Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th century BC was used by God, even though he, he wasn't saved at that point and he was antagonistic to God, God still used this man and his nation to judge these other ungodly nations, including the kingdom of Judah, which was in apostasy uh, in the 6th century BC. So God will use an evil ruler uh, to basically bring judgment on other nations. We're going to talk a lot about the theology that's in this book. That'll be one of the things that we note uh, in, uh, in this introduction. We'll also know the structure of the book. How is this particular uh, book, Obadiah, put together? There's a certain, uh, certain outline we can give for this book, and that's going to help us understand this book and interpret it. And also, we're going to see uh, the unity of this book and the purposes uh, the purposes in this book, there's a, the overriding purpose in this book, as we'll see, is God dealing with uh, the, uh, the nation of Edom. But there's more than that. It goes even further. It go, in this book, God is also telling is, uh, the Jews and all the nations, even up to our present day through this book, that he's going to establish his son's kingdom on the earth. The last verses 15 through 21 of Obadiah are about God establishing his kingdom uh, on this earth, and that Israel will be head of the nations with the Messiah ruling in, that, in, in Israel for a thousand years. So there's some references to the millennial reign of Christ, and the establishment, which is the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth, which is yet future, which we're all going to be involved in, because we're the bride of Christ, and the, the body, members of the body of Christ, so we're involved in that. So uh, then lastly, we're going to be deal, dealing with the historical background of the book. Uh, there's this book, like all the books in the Bible, was written in a particular period in history. And so you have to understand many times the historical background of these particular books in order to really interpret it accurately. So if, like, for instance, when we read Paul's writings, like we did Colossians. Colossians, when was it written? We talked about that. It was written by Paul. And he was in the Roman Empire. And he was under house arrest. And that's the historical background. He wrote that letter like he did Ephesians and Philippians and Philemon, which we studied as well, Philemon. And he wrote that in a particular period of history between 60 and 62 AD. And we went through the reasons why it was around that period. It was his first Roman imprisonment, which he was released from. And then we did 2 Timothy one time, and that was his second Roman imprisonment toward the mid to late 60s of the first century, which resulted in his death. So we talked about the historical background in those situations. So the contents of the letter will help us a lot of times understand the, the, the background, uh, the historical background of the letter. And sometimes we just have to go and look at uh, these books in historical context. So one of the things I bring out 
and when we're talking about your study of the Bible, you have the study that you have with me, and but you also should be having your own private study study time uh, in your uh, in, in your Bible, sanctified time, whatever you can uh, uh, do that. You should do it because both go together, and so not you just can't. Some are strong and they come to Bible class all the time, but they don't have any. They don't take any time to study their Bible, whether it's you know, 15 minutes, a half hour a day, or an hour, if they can do that, that's great. But they don't spend any time to do that in prayer. you got to have both. That's the way God meant it. Now, one of the things that you need to do, and you don't have to be, have a library like mine, but every, I believe every Christian, if they're a serious student of the Bible, and we're just talking lay people here, should have one or two Bible dictionaries. And they're really, a lot of them are really cheap. I've given them away as gifts to people. And uh, what those books are great is they, they basically... They'll go, you want to talk about different historical characters in the Bible or the different books of the Bible. These Bible dictionaries will go and they'll give you what we're going to be talking about in the study of Obadiah and the different books of the Bible. They will give you in their, uh, their synopsis of the different books of the Bible. So they'll go into the things that we go into. And so, and there, you know, there's, there's all types of new Bible dictionary is a good one. Lexham Bible dictionary is a good one. Holman, there's a ton of them out there. Harper's. Erdman's, and any one of those are great Bible dictionaries, and they help you understand the various books of the Bible, and gives you, they give you little articles, and some are bigger than others, about these various subjects or people in the Bible or historical places, and you want, you're reading your Bible, like, where's this place, you know, where's, uh, you know, we're going to see some of these places in Obadiah, where's Edom, you know, well, what was Edom? Well, you can go to a Bible dictionary, and it'll tell you about them. Now, what's cool, so you, went, you should have that, and, various, and you should have a couple of different types of translation in your Bibles, in your, in your, your library. Uh, I, I, ESV is a, what we call a formal equivalence translation, and uh, the New American Standard, ESV is a good one. NIV is a good Bible, it's dynamic equivalence. Both are different approaches to translation. Both get the job done. And, uh, I, and, and then you have the Net Bible, which actually is the first Bible I know to come out that has acknowledged the fact that they use both approaches. Every trans, there are a lot of translations say they're formal equivalents like the ESV, but they use dynamic equivalents. They have to. They can't, otherwise they'd have these ridiculously wooden translations that would sound stupid in English. So, uh, what we have, so I would say definitely get the Net Bible. And if I was sitting down and reading the Bible, I would say the NIV, today's NIV, very good reading Bible. So is the, uh, the Net Bible and so is the ESV. But I think the, Net, the, the NIV is still the best uh, to sit down and read. And the, I think a good study Bible, the best kind of time to study Bibles, are like the ESV and the New American Standard when you're teaching in a Bible class and you like to pull stuff from the original language as a pastor. I think those Bibles are better. So what's also, as we go further, we're going to start talking about this book, Obadiah, I think you're going to really like this because there's the historical background with this book. This actually, God gets mad at a nation called Edom. Edom, as we'll see, they were people who descended from a guy named Esau. For those of you who did Genesis with me, Esau and Jacob, if you remember that story, Isaac and Rebekah, remember you had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac got married to Rebekah, and they had twins. And they had twins, and one boy was named Jacob, and one was Esau. And they had problems, those two brothers, their, all their lives. They finally patched it up. But the descendants of these two men, one, the descendants of Esau were called Edom. They, they settled down in an area called Petra, south, uh, south of, uh, uh, of uh, Israel today. And uh, then Jacob, who got his name changed by God to Israel, his descendants were he had 12 sons, they became the nation of Israel. Well, these two, these two groups of the descendants, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, and the descendants of Ed uh, Esau, the Edomites, never got along with each other. They were at odds with each other for a long time. And then when Judah was disciplined by God, uh, 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 disciplined by God through Nebuchadnezzar, what happened was, is that Esau, the descendants of Esau, Edom, rejoiced and actually took part in going against their blood relatives. So God was angry with Edom, who were descendants of Esau, for being, uh, acting cruelly and having cruelty and even killing their blood relatives. So God gets angry. It shows that God gets angry when uh, blood relatives 
uh, hurt each other and go after each other. It shows that God deals with those situations. So God judged Edom for their cruel treatment of Judah. While God was treating, was disciplining Judah, the other one, the, the descendants of Esau were going, ha ha, we love this. And God got really angry about that. And he, does, he disciplined Edom. So this is a great, interesting story. And this will bring out something else that God, you know, how much more does God not like? If he's like that with uh, the, 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 the you know, descendants of Jacob and Esau, and he got angry with Edom's cruel treatment of, of, of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, how much more does God get angry with members of the body of Christ who hurt each other and are cruel to each other? He doesn't like it. So we got a lot of stuff. This is a cool book. I think you'll enjoy it. So it, let's start off. Because it's only one chapter long, it's only 21 verses, let's just read the book all the way, let's read it all the way through. Let's get an idea. We're going to do this quite a bit, okay? In fact, every time we sit down and look at this book and study this book on a Sunday, we're going to read the whole book right through, because it's only one chapter, all right? Because you want to get, and also, and I say this when we do First John or any other book, during the week... Read Obadiah on your own. Read it through. Get to learn. Get familiar with it. Uh, I know most people don't even know about this book. So uh, let's, take a, let's take a stab at it. Look at Obadiah. Look at verse 1. Remember, only one chapter in the book. Obadiah 1. The vision, I'm reading for the Net Bible. The vision that Obadiah saw. The Lord God says this concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord. An envoy was sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us make war against Edom. The Lord says, Look, I will make you a weak nation. You will be greatly despised. Your presumptuous heart has deceived you. You who reside in the safety of the rocky cliffs, whose home is high in the mountains, you think to yourself, No one can bring me down to the ground. Notice God is not happy with their arrogance. So we're going to talk about arrogance in this book too. How des destructive it is and how God deals with it. Even Verse 4, even if you were to soar high like an eagle, even if you were to make your nest among the stars, I can bring you down even from there, says the Lord. If thieves came to rob you during the night, they would steal only as much as they wanted. If grape pickers came to harvest your vineyards, they would leave some behind for the poor, but you will be totally destroyed. How the people of Esau, the people of Esau are Edom, will be thoroughly plundered. Their hidden valuables will be ransacked. All your allies will force you from your homeland. Your treaty partners will deceive you and overpower you. Your trusted friends will set an ambush for you. That will take you by surprise. At that time, the Lord says, I will destroy the wise sages of Edom. They were known for their wise men. The advisors from Esau's mountain. Your warriors will be shattered, O Teman. That was a, one of the prominent cities in the nation of Edom. So that everyone will be destroyed from Esau's mountain. Now look what he says in verse 10. Now, he's just, he's just talked about what they did to the kingdom of Judah, the people of Edom. Now look what happens in verse 10. Because you, uh, you no, excuse me, what, he just, what we just saw is God, what God's going to do to Edom, but he hasn't, he hasn't listed yet, and he's going to in verses 10 through 14, the, he's going to list the crimes which is going to be the basis for their punishment that God just predicted in those previous verses that we just read. And this is in the Old Testament books everywhere. This is what God does. It's kind of like, you know, when, you go, when you're in a court case. You know, God brings the up in the Supreme Court of Heaven and he lists the charges against the nation and he brings in, and he, and he brings in the judgment. Okay? God never judges without a basis for the judgment. And this is what we got going on here. Now look at verse 10. Because you violently slaughtered your relatives. Who were their relatives? The people of Jacob. Why? Because Jacob and Esau were brothers, so therefore their descendants were blood relatives. Shame will cover you, he says, and you will be destroyed forever. You stood aloof while, aloof while strangers took his army captive, and foreigners advanced to his gates, his gates speaking the people of Judah, the, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites. When they cast lots over Jerusalem, you behaved as though you were in league with them. You should not have gloated when your relatives suffered calamity. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah when they were destroyed. You should not have boasted when they suffered adversity. Notice the rejoicing over the fact that their blood relatives were uh, being judged or being de destroyed by an enemy. That, takes, that goes back to Proverbs chapter 24, verses 17 and 18. 
You don't do that. When you see your enemy getting dealt with by God, you are not to sit there and clap your hands and jump for joy. And this is a book that's going to teach you that. You don't do that. Because you know what God will do? He'll come back and deal with you. See, God deals with attitudes and not just, be, as, uh, not just behaviors as well. So, look at it. It goes on to say, and... Uh, uh, in verse uh, 12 again, you should not have gloated when your relatives suffered calamity. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah when they were destroyed. You should not have suffered, uh, boasted when they have suffered adversity. You should not have entered the city of my people when they expre experienced distress. You should not have joined in gloating over their misfortune when they suffered distress. You should not have looted their wealth when they endured distress. You should not have stood at the fork in the road to slaughter those trying to escape. You should not have captured their refugees when they suffered adversity. So look at he's dealing with. He just listed in verses 10 through 14 the list of crimes. It's an indictment. We call it a list of indictments against the nation of Edom. And that's the basis for the prophecies that we see in verses 1 all the way to verse 9. The prophecies of Edom's doom. God just, going, he's giving, just gave us the reasons in verses 10 through 14 why he's going to deal with them. Then... We see the, the coming of the day of the Lord. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord is approaching for all the nations. Just as you have done, so it will be done to you. You will get exactly what your deeds deserve. This is how God rules the nations. And if he does that with the nations, how much more does he do? He, does, he must do that with individuals. So if you want to be, betray somebody, guess what? God will have somebody come in and betray you. If you want to steal from somebody... You, dealt, you will be dealt with. So somebody will steal from you. So be careful the way you treat another person as, it's been dealt, as you dished it out to somebody else, it'll be dealt, you'll be done to you. So God doesn't like, so God deals with people's behaviors and attitudes and context. Everything in this book we've seen tells us that. So verse 15, for the day of the Lord is approaching for all the nations, just as you have done, so it will be done to you. You will get exactly what your deeds deserve. And that's just illustrated in the first 14 verses of the book. For just as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and they will gulp down. They will be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, there will be a remnant of those who escape, a remnant of Jews. And it will be a holy place once again. And that's going to be speaking of the millennial kingdom. The descendants of Jacob will conquer those who had conquered them. The descendants, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, will be a fire, and the descendants of Joseph, a flame. The descendants of Esau, though, will be like a stubble. They will burn them up and devour them. They will not be a single survivor of the descendants of Esau. Indeed, the Lord has spoken it. Verse 19, the people of the Negev will take possession of Esau's mountain, and the people of Shephelah will take possession of the land of the Philistines. They will also take possession of the territory of Ephraim, and the territory of Samaria, and the people of Benjamin will take possession of Gilead. The exiles of this fortress of the people of Israel will take possession of what belongs to the people of Canaan as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in a Sepharad will take possession of the towns of the Negev. Those who have been delivered will go up on Mount Zion in order to rule over Esau's mountain. Then the Lord will reign as king. So verses, what we saw in verses um, 18 through the end of the book is speaking of the millennial kingdom of Christ when Jew Jerusalem, Israel, the Israelites, with Christ as their king and king over the whole earth, will be the head of the nations, Israel will. So they will be, and they have, a, and when we get to that, those verses and study them in detail, it's the millennial kingdom. It's talking about the land that Israel will have. It's talking a little bit about that. So this is the book that we just, we just read. That's the, enti the entire, entirety of the book, only one chapter long. And as I said, it only takes us a few months to uh, study this particular book. Now, what we're going to do, this, well, let's look at, for the rest of the class, let's talk about the, uh, in the introduction. Let's start the introduction today. And st by starting to note some of the things I mentioned at the beginning of class, we'll go today we're going to note the authorship of this book, who wrote this book, and do we know anything about this guy, if at all, and also the date of this book, when was it written, that's important, and place, where was it written, who were the recipients, who was the author writing to, as well as the literary, literary genre, what type of literature it was. All these things, we're doing this, and we're going to do it next week and the week after, 
and then we'll start the verse by verse study. We do this because it's going to help us to interpret the book. You need to do these things many times if you really want to understand the various books of the Bible. That's not to say that you can't do it without these things and learn the Bible. You can learn from the Bible that you need to get saved. You have to have trust and faith alone and Christ alone. That's pretty self-explanatory. But there's some th a lot of things in these books that we need to uh, learn interpretive-wise that before we look at them verse by verse. Now, the book of Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It's the shortest book in the Old Testament, and it only contains 21 verses. The New Testament doesn't even quote from it. So consequently, especially by modern audiences in the church, this tiny book in the Old Testament has been overlooked or totally ignored and to the detriment of the church. And it, it, that's, that's, it's very bad that the church doesn't teach these books in the Old Testament. We are supposed to go to teach the whole Bible. The full counsel of God is in Old Testament and New Testament. And it's very important we do both, uh, do Old Testament and New Testament. And that's what we do here. This book, Obadiah, has been ignored because also, like Zephaniah, which we studied a couple of years ago, it speaks of God's judgment. And God's judgment is not a very popular subject in our world today, even in the church. And God does judge. God does judge, and he's a God of judgment. And of course, God is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness, but we have to repent to receive that. For an unbeliever, that means change your attitude about Jesus Christ and trust in him as your savior. And uh, to do that, you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner and need a savior and that Jesus is that savior. If you're a believer, repentance means confess your sins and do what God's word tells you to do. Now, Obadiah promises to exact vengeance upon the nation of Edom because they mistreated the southern kingdom of Judah, as we'll see, in the 6th century B.C. when they were conquered by Babylon. The Edomites and the Israelites were related because the, the former descended from Esau, as I pointed out to you, and the latter, the Israelites, descended from Jacob. We're going to take a class and we're going to look back at the, the, where this rivalry took place. Where did it begin? We'll look at Genesis uh, where the story of Jacob and Esau, these two brothers, and the, the problems that they had, which eventually they patched up, they reconciled, but their descendants were at, at war with each other for centuries. Both of these guys, Jacob and Esau, were brothers. And so their descendants were therefore blood relatives with each other. Thus God was angry because the Edomites mistreated the Israelites who were their blood brothers. God, God doesn't like, as we just saw in Obadiah, God, one of the indictments that God gave against Edom is that you rejoiced. You rejoiced over the suffering of your blood relatives, the descendants of Jacob. And God's angry with that. If he's that way with nations, how much more is he that with individuals? We know he's, he gets upset when individuals do that, when people rejoice over their enemies uh, uh, suffering adversity or calamity. Uh, we know that from Proverbs. Hold your place. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. Hold your place. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. Verse 17. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Now, the Edom, the people of Edom... They didn't do that. They disobeyed this. And when he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. Edom did this. Verse 18. Here's why they shouldn't do that. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn his wrath away from him. And you know what you turn away from him to do what? To give it to you. You what? So therefore, if somebody, this is a, this is a principle we'll study. And when you, somebody has done something to you, I don't care what they've done. And God and God will bring in, he'll deal with them if they don't repent, okay? So we talk, let's talk about a believer or something. If they don't repent, eventually God is, yes, he's going to discipline them. And when it happens, and it will happen, may it happen in a month, two years, five years, whatever, but when it comes down, don't you dare rejoice over that. You should be sad. You should be like King David was. When King Saul, who a, a, brother, a, a blood brother, Plus, a brother in the Lord. Saul was saved in the first king of Israel. He tried to kill David without a cause because he was jealous of David and envious of David because the Lord was with him. And he knew that David was going to be the next king after him. And so Saul tried to kill David. 
And David, when finally, God, after years of being on the run from Saul and being uh, basically driven out of his homeland, away from his family and everything, Saul was killed on the battlefield. And what did David do? He was very sad. He expressed his joy. And he actually praised Saul and his son Jonathan, who he was very close to, his, his, his close brother. And Jonathan died in war with, uh, with, uh, with Saul. And da David didn't rejoice over the defeat of Saul. And that's the way we should be when a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ who is unrepentant about their sinful behavior and what they did to you, and they get judged by God, disciplined by God, don't you rejoice over it. You should be saddened by it. Don't say anything. Just go off and pray uh, for the, the, uh, pray for the family. Pray for them. So, therefore, there's a very good principle. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and when he stumbles. Do not let your heart rejoice, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn his wrath away from him. So, go back to Obadiah, please. So, the book of Obadiah is what we call one of the minor prophets, which are called the book of the twelve in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so when we talk about Obadiah, it's a part of a group of writers, prophets in the Old Testament Israel, who are called minor prophets. Now, they're only minor in the sense that each of these 12 books are much shorter than the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, who are identified as major prophets. Because Isaiah is like, what, 66 chapters long? Jeremiah is what, over, over fit, around 50? And then Ezekiel is a huge book as well. So they were called major prophets primarily because of the content. They had a ton of content in their writings. Whereas Obadiah with these other books, other 11 prophets in their books, like Zephaniah that we studied, uh, they are basically called minor prophets. Now, uh, these 12 books, the books of the 12 minor prophets, cover approximately 300 years, from 760 B.C. to approximately 450 B.C., ending with Malachi. Malachi is the last book in your Old Testament. Except for the book of Jonah, these books all identify the author in a heading. They're arranged in the biblical canon chronologically with the exception of Joel and Obadiah. And a theme, or a possibly a catchword, might explain the canonical position of Ob Obadiah. What I mean by canonical position is where this book is located in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, a lot of times they would put it in the time in which it was written, like, you know, what, the oldest to the, to the newest. That's not the case with Joel and Obadiah. They're unusual, these two books. We studied Joel when we were down in Alabama. Now, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, and Micah, all minor prophets, which are found toward the end of your Old Testament, were written in the 8th century B.C. Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah were penned in the 7th century B.C. Joel, Obadiah, Haggai, and Zechariah were composed in the 6th century B.C. And 6th century B.C., is Obadiah, where Obadiah was written, as we'll see in a moment, 6th century B.C. goes from, you know, 600 B.C. to 500 B.C. Okay, that, that, that's how you, that's the 6th century B.C. Malachi, the last book written in the Old Testament, was written in the 5th century B.C. Now the major prophets, who are they again? Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They're called major because they're huge books. Then the minor prophets, because they didn't have as much content as the other three that I just mentioned, the minor prophets are Hosea, excuse me, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Now, there's a guy who just, a friend of mine who just did an Old Testament survey, and I'll tell you about that in a sec. Jim Ricard, Pastor Jim Ricard, who I um, got ordained with, and he did something that I'm going to do in, in not too distant future, is do a survey, survey of the Bible. So basically what that is, is a, a, you go through an overview, really, of the different books and get the idea of the story of each book and the themes of the, each book. And he, he did that for uh, all the Old Testament. So one day I'm going to do that because it'll help us to familiarize ourselves with the Bible and where these different books are, okay? So that's going to be coming up, maybe, uh, that's going to be coming up in between books on a Sunday one of these days. So, now the author of the book of, uh, of Obadiah is shrouded in mystery. Look at Obadiah 1. We don't know anything about this guy. Really. We don't know anything. The, it says in verse 1, the vision that Obadiah saw, the Lord God says this concerning Edom. So you see there what he's, he's, he's doing. He doesn't say anything about himself. He doesn't say anything about himself whatsoever. Now, uh, not, not one thing he says about him, which is very unusual. Usually you see 
and, uh, and Obadiah, uh, you are these Old Testament books, the writer identifying who he is, who he descended from, and where he, and where he was, and what, what, where he came from. Uh, you're, hold your place. Look at Ezekiel for a second. Look at Ezekiel. Look at the very first verse. Obadiah doesn't tell you anything about the historical situation that he's in. But, based upon, as we'll see, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and the contents of the book, we can, and knowing history and biblical history, we can tell when he actually wrote, as we'll see in a minute. But I want to compare, I'm going to compare Obadiah with these other guys in the Old Testament. They give us much more information about themselves and their historical situation that they were writing in. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, in the 30th year. On the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was among the exiles at the Kabar River, the heavens opened and I saw a divine vision. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came to the priest, Ezekiel, the son of Buzai, at the Kabar River in the land of the Babylonians. The hand of the Lord came on him there. Now we know who he, who's his father was, okay? We know where he was when he wrote. Did you see that in Obadiah? Not one thing is written. Obadiah doesn't give us anything about his situation. Look at, uh, oh, let's say, um, look at Jeremiah. It's before Ezekiel. Look at Jeremiah. Look at verse 1. So when the, when the writer like Obadiah doesn't give any information about who he is, where he came from, what his historical situation he's writing in, like these other guys, we have to do work a little harder. That's why I say this introduction uh, is a little bit, uh, uh, can go, this one is, uh, uh, in Obadiah, it's very important that we look into this because it, the writer is not giving us this, this information like these other writers, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah 1, the following is a record of what Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, prophesied. Now, again, this guy's telling you who his father was, who he's descended from. Obadiah, we don't know where he, who he descended from. He was one of the priests who lived at Anathoth in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. So we know his occupation. Obadiah, do we know his occupation? No. <laughs> so was uh, Ezekiel was a priest too, he just said. We don't know anything about that with Obadiah. The Lord began to speak to him in the 30, 13th year that Josiah, son of Ammon, ruled over Judah. There's a historical situation given to us. Obadiah doesn't give us that information. Though, verse 3, the Lord also spoke to him when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, ruled over Judah. And he continued to speak to him until the fifth month of the eleventh year that Zedekiah, son of Josiah, ruled over Judah. That was when the people of Judah, Jerusalem, were taken into exile. So there's the, we know that is the 6th century B.C. Okay? 580, the, 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 the Babylonians attacked the southern kingdom of Judah three times. 605 B.C., that's Daniel got thrown into exile after that. 597 B.C., Ezekiel was taken into exile into Babylon after that. And then 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar leveled the place and burned the place to the ground and, and, and took, uh, wiped out the, the, the nation and left a small remnant in, this, in, the, in the land and brought everybody else to be in, in exile. So basically, Israel, the kingdom of Judah, became, ceased to be a national entity with geographical boundaries at that time. That's because of God's judgment of the, of the people. So that's when, as we're going to see in a moment, that's when Obadiah wrote. He wrote, during, he's, he, he was a contemporary of Jeremiah. He, uh, Jeremiah see, saw the collapse of the nation, and so did Obadiah. Ezekiel, they were contemporaries with Obadiah. We're going to see that in, a, in this study of Obadiah. That tells you that Obadiah, as we'll say, wrote somewhere at the, in the 6th century B.C., at the at, after, sometime after the this final invasion of Nebuchadnezzar attacking Judah, go back to Obadiah now. Uh, remember where Jer Jeremiah is. We'll go back there too, I think. So now we see that Obadiah. We don't know anything about him. Nowhere in this book is the name of, his, of the author's father provided for, uh, provided for us or the place of his birth as we see with Ezekiel and Jeremiah and these other prophets in the Old Testament. With the prophet Obadiah, his message from God and not himself was most important. Now this is a little, this is a very important for pastors and evangelists to know and learn something from Obadiah, as well as you all who are not pastors and evangelists. 
Namely, it's message from God that's important to give to people and not you. Now, there's nothing wrong to tell something about yourself like these other guys did, but Obadiah doesn't do that, which is basically teaching us something here. Not that the other guys failed in this area, but rather Obadiah was all about God's message to the kingdom of Edom. And that's it, nothing about himself. And this is something we should learn from. It's about the message from God. Even Jesus did this. It's the message from God that's important to people, not you necessarily. It's not about you. It's about God and God's uh, trying to save people from the lake of fire and God trying to put, conform a people into the image of his son to worship him. Now, Obadiah's name is interesting. His name it means servant or worshiper of the Lord. We don't know exactly which, but it's either servant of the Lord or worshiper of the Lord. In a way, both concepts of serving and worshiping the Lord are tied together. You show you're worshiping the Lord by serving the Lord. So servant worshiper of the Lord might be a good meaning for this guy's, uh, this, this guy's name. So servant worshiper of the Lord is the way I'll tell, bring, it, bring it forth to you. So this guy, this is, that's what his name meant. Now his name, if you read your Old Testament, was very common. The name Obadiah shows up in 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. I won't give you the chapter and verse there, but it's in my notes if you want it. And it's on our website on PDF format with this lesson. You can download it. Thanks to Titus. It's hard work. So his name is very common in the Old Testament. Now the author of Obadiah is not the same Obadiah who appears in, let's say, 1 Kings 18. Uh, so that's very important. So he, his name shows up in other places, but in other times in Israel's history, in Judah's history, he, he, his, his, the person who wrote Obadiah is not found in those Old Test, other Old Testament books that I mentioned. Now the date of the book of Obadiah, which we're going to finish off the rest of the lesson today concentrating on, because it's very, uh, a very a, a difficult issue, and in fact, I think it's very important. The date of the book of Obadiah has been greatly debated by scholars because the Bible doesn't provide us with any facts about the author's life or background, as I pointed out. Now, the dating of the pro prophecy of Obadiah primarily revolves around verses 10 through 14. So look at verse 10, verses 10 through 14 of Obadiah, please. Go back there. Look at Obadiah. Look at verse 10. Verses 10 through 14, the contents of which help us, to, there's different interpretations based upon these verses. When we go to interpret the book of Obadiah, what we have to do is look at the contents of verses 10 through 14, because they're talking about things that were done historically by Edom against the kingdom of Judah, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites. So those verses are used to determine the date of the book. Now, there's different approaches to the date. There's six different views of the date. And I'm going to show you it's the 6th century B.C., which was, again, from 600 B.C. to 500 B.C., okay? And uh, 501 B.C., excuse me. So look at verse 10 of Obadiah. Because you violently slaughtered your relatives, this is what God, Edom did to, to, to the, the Jews, the kingdom, of Ju uh, the kingdom of Judah, the people of Jacob, see? Shame will cover you because you did this, and you'll be destroyed forever. You stood aloof, while strangers took his army, whose army? Jacob's army, the Jews. And foreigners advanced to his gates when they cast lots over Jerusalem. You behaved as though you were in league with them. Notice the things that are being said that took place in history when Edom did this to the kingdom of Judah. Because these things are very important to understand when the book was, uh, took place, when it was written. You should not have gloated when your relatives suffered calamity. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah when they were destroyed. You should not have boasted when they suffered adversity. You should not have entered the city of my people when they experienced distress. You should not have joined in gloating over their misfortune when they suffered distress. You should not have looted their wealth when they endured distress. You should not have stood at the fork in the road to slaughter those trying to escape. You should not have captured their refugees when they suffered adversity. So, those verses are going to help us understand when this book was written. Those verses, as we'll see, tell us it was written in the 6th century B.C. Sometime, sometime shortly after the final, Nebuchadnezzar's final invasion. Now, what I like to do is, many times, I like to give alternatives to my view. And I, before I tell you my view and why I think it is, all right? So it's important to do this. There are at least six dates which have been suggested by Bible scholars. First, some argue that these verses, verses 10 through 14 of Obadiah, were fulfilled when Jerusalem surrendered to the Egyptian ruler Shishak during the fifth year of Rehoboam. 
That would be 931 to 913 BC. The verses for this, 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 25 through 28, 2 Chronicles 12, 2 through 10. They describe what took place during that period. Edom during this period is identified as an enemy during this period. However, Rehoboam, who remember was a son of Solomon, Rehoboam uh, had the kingdom taken away from him because of what his father did. He forsook the Lord, King Solomon. He was in apostasy, died in apostasy, and God said, I won't take the kingdom away from you. I'll take it away from your son. And that's what he did with Rehoboam. There was a, not a civil, it was a civil war. Rehoboam listened to the young guys who told him to put a heavier burden on the people tax-wise and, 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 and heavier than his father who was already putting on a heavy burden on them, the people. And, the, and he didn't listen to the older guys who said, hey, relieve the tax burden on these people. And he didn't do it. He listened to the younger guys, and he said, I'm going to be tougher than my father. And 12 of the, uh, 10 of the tribes said, see you later. And they were gone. And they rebelled against him. And they were called the Northern Kingdom. In many books in the Old Testament, they're called, Israel's called, is referred to by the Northern Kingdom. Judah is called the Southern Kingdom. Judah had two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And it was called the tribe of Judah. The, the Northern Kingdom, which had 10 tribes, they were called the northern kingdom, and they were called Israel. That's why you're seeing a lot of the first and second kings, first and second chronicles, Israel and Judah. Well, they're talking about the two different kingdoms there. Okay? So, Rehoboam, his de Rehoboam's defeat uh, from, at the hands of the Egyptian ruler did not result in the enslavement or destruction of the southern kingdom, an attempt to escape from the enemy, which is described in verses 10 through 14. So, it can't be that date, it can't be between 931 and 913 BC that Obadiah was written. Some interpret Obadiah 10 through 14 as describing the second recorded invasion of Jerusalem during the reign of Jehoram. That was in 853 to 841 BC. Arab and Philistine armies invaded Judah, which resulted in the capture of the king's family and the plundering of his wealth. The account of that is in 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, and 2 Chronicles 21, 1, uh, 22, 1, excuse me. At this time, Judah wasn't at, was at odds with Edom. 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 20 through 22 tell us that. 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 8 through 10. However, this judgment was directed specifically at the king. It was not directed at the kingdom of Judah. 2 Chronicles 21, 14, and 17 tell us that. There's another view is uh, uh, regarding the history of, of the interpretation of the date of Obadiah and verses 10 through 14, some believe those verses describe the third invasion of Judah during the reign of a king named Jehoash. That's between 835 and 796 when he reigned. The Syrians caused great destruction by plundering the country and defeating the Judean army, which was the result of the Lord's judgment upon Judah. The account of that is in 2 Chronicles 24, 23 and 24. Now during the reign of Amaziah, which followed jo Joash, Edom remained hostile to Judah. However, Edom's role in this destruction has literal scriptural report or historical evidence. Some view Obadiah verses 10 through 14 as having been fulfilled when Jerusalem was captured during the time of Amaziah. That would be between 796 and 767 BC. And the reason why is because the city, Jerusalem, was plundered and prisoners of war were taken when there were open hostilities with Edom, 2 Kings 14, 7-14, just for support. However, this description in the account doesn't even come close to corresponding with the contents of Obadiah 10-14. There's a fifth view, and that of verses 10-14. Some people believe that they were fulfilled during the 8th century BC, when Edom was at war with Judah during the reign of Ahaz, in particular, that would, between the years, that would be between the years of 735 and 715 B.C. This king was judged by the Lord for his unfaithfulness, like a lot of the kings of Israel and Judah were. That's 2 Chronicles 28, 17. Many of the citizens of Judah and Jerusalem were killed in war and taken as prisoners of war. That's according to 2 Chronicles 29, verses 8 and 9. Interestingly, during this century, the prophets of Israel declared judgment against Edom. Isaiah did, Amos did. And, uh, and, and those books, they, they uh, issued prophecies or they, they, um, they published prophecies against this nation of Edom who is being described in Obadiah 10 through 14. However, the problem with that is, unlike Obadiah 10 through 14, which describes the destruction of Jerusalem 
and the capture of its people, you don't see any record of the capture or destruction of Jerusalem in, uh, the, in that period of time. Now, what I believe, as I said before, is that Obadiah 10 through 14 is describing Edom's conduct during Nebuchadnezzar's final invasion of Judah and her capital city, Jerusalem, in 586 BC. Remember, as I said before, we study this in Daniel, we study this in Zer uh, uh, Zephaniah. This is important because the Bible is written, in, in, each book in the Bible is written in a particular historical setting. And it's important to understand that, okay? Interpreting wise, all right? Because otherwise you, you, can, you can misinterpret a book by thinking it's written in a different period of history. This book was not written, Obadiah, in the days of the Roman Empire. And it wasn't written, you know, it wasn't written uh, during the 10th century BC. It wasn't written during the time of David or King Saul or King Solomon. No, it was written at a particular time when God was judging Judah, the descendants of Jacob. So I, what we see is there's three invasions that Nebuchadnezzar had. This is supported by history itself, secular literature, not just the Bible. The Bible talks a lot about this because it's God's uh, judgment of the kingdom of Judah for their apostasy. So that tells us God uses a wicked ruler like Nebuchadnezzar to exact, to, to deal out retribution and to exercise his wrath to his people. Not just his people, but all the surrounding peoples. God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge nations. Who, and he was a wicked ruler. And that's what God will do even today. All right? He could take a wicked ruler or he could take a just ruler and use that nation, that nation or a wicked nation to bring about his wrath. And that's very important. So Nebuchadnezzar, he had an invasion of 605 BC, as I mentioned earlier. Daniel was taken out on that invasion. He mentions that. Okay? He mentions that in the book of Daniel. And then there's 597 BC, and that's Ezekiel went out on that invasion. He was deported with a bunch of Jews. And then finally, in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had enough of these people rebelling against him. See, what he would do is set up a puppet king, but he would rebel against them or he'd be assassinated. So he decided, I'm, I've had enough of these people. I'm leveling the city. He, he destroyed the temple. He destroyed Solomon's temple, and he took all the articles to him to Babylon. Daniel mentioned some of that. And... These things, he went there, that was the final invasion, and the, he left a small remnant of people, the poor, in the land, whereas he took all the nobles and all the uh, richer people, uh, people who had skill that he could use, he brought them to Babylon, and they were there for 70 years, according to Jeremiah's prophecy. And he was brought, they brought, were back in, brought back in 70 years later. We study this in the book of Daniel. So this is, this is telling you, this is helping us understand the book of Obadiah. These are the books that we've studied in the past. Some of this should be familiar with some of you who have been following uh, me. Now, I want to show you something about, really interesting about Jeremiah, uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, because I'm telling you, uh, Obadiah was writ written in the days of, uh, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Look at Jeremiah. I want to show you something about what God's, you, how he used, uh, he used uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Look at Jeremiah 27.1, please. Jeremiah 27, verse 1. Get used to going to Jeremiah and Ezekiel because they're in, with Obadiah because that's what we're going to do. Because Obadiah takes a lot from, uh, is a contemporary of these guys, and they, 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 they both speak of Edom. They all speak of Edom. Jeremiah 27, 1. I took you to this passage because God used a wicked ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, as his instrument to judge his people and other nations who were not his people. Jeremiah 27, 1. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah early in the reign of Josiah's son, King Zedekiah of Judah. The Lord told me, make a yoke out of leather straps and wooden crossbars and put it on your neck. Use it to send messages to the king of Edom, the kings of Edom, see? Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. We saw all those nations were judged in the book of Zephaniah, we saw. God used Nebuchadnezzar to deal with them. We saw that in Zephaniah. Send them through the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to King Zedekiah of Judah. Charge them to give their masters a message from me. Tell them, the Lord God of Israel, who rules over all, says to give your masters this message. I made the earth and the people and the animals on it by my mighty power and great strength, and I give it to whomever I see fit. That's called the sovereignty of God. I have at this time placed all these nations of yours under the power of my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. His servant, God calls him. Does that mean they were having fellowship together? No. He just says, this guy's an evil guy. I'm still going to use him. 
He's evil and he's going to do terrible things and he's going to go to war with these nations and I'm going to use him because I want to use him as my instrument of judgment without him even knowing that. Of course, we know from the book of Daniel, he ended up getting saved through Daniel's ministry and the miracles that God performed. So he goes on to say, I have even made all the wild animals subject to him. All nations must serve him and his son and his grandson until the time comes for his own nation to fall. See, God's going to take him out, his nation out. Then many nations and great kings will in turn subjugate Babylon. But suppose a nation or a kingdom will not be subject to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Suppose it will not submit to the yoke of servitude to him. I, the Lord, affirm that I will punish that nation. I will use the king of Babylon to punish it with war, starvation, and disease until I have destroyed it. And that's what he did to the king of Judah and all these other nations, including Edom. Edom eventually was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's armies too. They betrayed their blood relatives and God turned around and Babylon betrayed them. Deal with them. So go back to Obadiah, chapter 10. So what is the date? How do we, I say the date of the, of the prophecy of Obadiah is in the 6th century BC, sometime after the final, Nebuchadnezzar's final invasion of Jerusalem and Judah in 586 BC. Where do I get that? Well, in 586, the wealth of Jerusalem was plundered and a great portion of the population deported to Babylon. We know that from 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 13 through 16, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 18 and 20. We also know the city was very nearly burned to the ground, including the temple. That's 2 Kings 25, 9 and 10. 2 Chronicles 36, 19. Many of her citizens were, citizens were slaughtered, just like Obadiah says. 2 Kings 25, 8 through 21. 2 Chronicles 36, 17 uh, mentions this. Also, this mentioned in 2 Kings 24, verses 4 and 5, the account of the king's un, a king of Judah's unsuccessful attempt to escape with a small band of soldiers. There are many historical accounts of Edom's terrible conduct during this time. They joined a coalition of nations to fight with Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah 27, 3. And Jeremiah 40, verse 11. Remember, we saw in Obadiah 10 through 14, they joined Judah's enemies to wage war against Judah. They were accused, Edom was also accused of taking its revenge out on Judah by Ezekiel 25, verse 12. They were condemned by Ezekiel for delivering over the people of Judah to Babylon as prisoners of war. That's in Ezekiel 35, verses 5 and 6. Compare that with Lamentations 1, 17. They were guilty of rejoicing over Judah's defeat and Jerusalem's destruction, which we saw in the book of Obadiah being described. That's Psalm 137, verse 7. Lamentations, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. 421. Ezekiel, chapter 35, verses 11 through 15. And Ezekiel 36, 2 through 6. Now, the prophetic declarations of judgment against Edom reached their climax during this invasion. Lastly, Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 7 through 21, and Ezekiel chapters 35 and 36 are echoed by Obadiah chapter 10, verse 14. So, look at, uh, look at Obadiah chapter 10, verse 14 again. I want to read it again, and then we're going to go to Jeremiah and end this thing, our class today. Look at Jeremiah 10, excuse me, Obadiah 10, excuse me. Because you violently slaughtered your relatives, the people of Jacob, Edom, Shame will cover you and you'll be destroyed forever. You stood aloof while strangers took his army captive and foreigners advanced to his gates when they cast lots over Jerusalem. You behaved as though you were in league with them. You should not have gloated when your relatives suffered calamity. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah when they were destroyed. You should not have boasted when they suffered adversity. You should not have entered the city of my people when they experienced distress. You should not have joined in gloating over their misfortune when they suffered distress. You should not have looted their wealth when they endured distress. You should not have stood at the fork in the road to slaughter those who were trying to escape. You should not have captured their refugees when they suffered adversity. Hold, uh, hold your place. Go now to Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49. Look at verse 7. You know, our Bibles, like the Net Bible, you'll see a, a title for this section before, ahead of Jeremiah 49, 7 that says, Judgment Against Edom. And Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Spirit like Obadiah, lists the indictments against Edom and why God's going to judge them. Look at Jeremiah 49, 7. The Lord who rules over all spoke about Edom. Is wisdom no longer to be found in Teman? 
Remember the wisdom of Teman? The wisdom of the, of, the, of the Edomites is mentioned in Obadiah? Can Edom's counselors not give her any good advice? Has all of their wisdom turned bad? Turn and flee. Take up refuge in remote places, you people who live in Dedan. For I will bring disaster on the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. I have decided it's time for me to punish them. If grape pickers came to pick your grapes, would they not leave a few grapes behind? If robbers came at night, would they not pillage only what they needed? Doesn't that sound like Obadiah? Yeah. And we know where Obadiah was historically. He lived during the, in Nebuchadnezzar's invasions. Okay, very important here. Look at uh, verse 10. But I will strip everything away from Esau's descendants. I will uncover their hiding places so that they cannot hide. They, they built their cities in rocky high places. You ever hear the city of Petra? Okay, very, dif very difficult to attack militarily. But it can be done. The Romans did it, but it took a lot of lives to do it. So he says, in verse 10, I will strip everything away from Esau's descendants. I will uncover their hiding places so that they cannot hide. Their children, relatives, and neighbors will all be destroyed. Not one of them will be left. Leave your orphans behind, and I will keep them alive. Your widows, too, can depend on me. For the Lord says, if even those who did not deserve to drink from the cup of my wrath must drink from it, do you think you will go unpunished? <laughs> You will not go unpunished, but you most certainly drink from the cup of my wrath. For I solemnly swear, says the Lord, that Basra will become a pile of ruins. It will become an object of horror and ridicule, an example to be used in curses. So that he goes on to say, Basra, uh, Basra is one of, a, a prominent city in, in, in the nation of Edom. And he says, all the towns around it will lie in ruins forever. Verse 14, I said, I have heard the message from the Lord. A messenger has been sent among the nations to say, gather your armies and march out against her. Prepare to do battle with her. The Lord says to Edom, I will certainly make you small among the nations. I will make you despised by all humankind. That's what Obadiah says in his writings. In the first verses of the book. Then he says in verse 16, The terror you inspire in others, and the arrogance of your heart has deceived you, which Obadiah mentions their arrogance. You may make your home in the clefts of the rocks, and you may occupy the highest places in the hills. But even if you made your home where the eagles nest, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Boy, it sounds almost like verbatim with Obadiah. Oh, yeah. Well, we know Jeremiah, when he wrote, during the invasions of Nebuchadnezzar, he says that. So Obadiah is going to be around at the same time. Verse 17, Edom will become an object of horror. All who pass by it will be filled with horror. They will hiss out their scorn because of all the disasters that have happened to it. Edom will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah and the towns that were around them. No one will live there. No human being will settle in it, says the Lord. A lion will coming up from the thick undergrowth along the Jordan scatters the sheep in the pasture land around it. So too I will chase the Edomites off their land. That was fulfilled in history. Then I will appoint over it whomever I choose, for there is no one like me, and there's no one who can call me to account. There's no ruler who could stand up against me. That's God's sovereignty there. So listen to what I, the Lord, have planned against Edom, what I intend to do to the people who live in Teman, another city in Edom. Their little ones will be dragged off. I will completely destroy their land because of what they have done. The people of the earth will quake when they hear their downfall. Their cries of anguish will be heard all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba. Look, like an eagle with outspread wings, a nation will soar up and swoop down on Basra. That was Nebuchadnezzar in his, uh, Babylon. At that time, the soldiers of Edom will be as fearful as a woman in labor. So we'll go back to Obadiah. So as we close, Obadiah's graphic description makes it likely that he wrote his book not long after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 BC. He also predicted the fall of Edom as a future event, so he must have written before the late 6th century BC when Edom was destroyed. If we take all this evidence into account, it would seem that the book of evidence, uh, Obadiah was written approximately five, between 585 and 550 BC in the 6th century. Obadiah was probably written in the southern kingdom of Judah because his prophecy addresses his concern over the Edomites rejoicing over the Babylonian invasion of Judah. It appears that Obadiah, Obadiah had a first-hand account of the destruction and what Edom, the people of Edom were doing. He more than likely lived in Jerusalem as well because he expresses his concern for this city. Or if he did not live in this city, he must have lived somewhere in the towns or cities surrounding uh, in Judah. Now the contents of the book of Obadiah reveal that the recipients of its contents were the southern kingdom of Judah who went to Babylon in exile. He's writing to them and possibly to warn the Edomites so that they would repent. 
So might you probably definitely have the Jews he's writing to to give them encouragement who went into exile in Babylon that God is a God of justice. He saw what your blood relatives, the Edomites, did. He will call them to account. He will judge their nation just like I judged your nation for their un unrepentant behavior. And the prophecy, I wouldn't be surprised when that prophecy was, pro that prophecy was published by a prophet like Obadiah, the whole Mediterranean and Mesopotamian region of the world got their hands on this eventually. And so more than likely, some of the Edomites were reading this and they got, and if they didn't repent, they would definitely face this judgment. And they did. They didn't, they weren't, history tells us they were unrepentant and God judged that nation and he used Nebuchadnezzar's armies to do that. So as we close, what style of writing is it? What kind of literature are we finding here? It's actually poetry, people. What we're reading in Obadiah, in our English translations, in Hebrew, it's a poetry. It's poem. You see this a lot in the Bible. It's actually prophecy with poetry. It's poetic prophecy is what it is. So it's a really cool book. So a lot of times you'll see some of the translations, I think like the NIV, they'll try to bring out the fact that it's poetry. It's very hard to do to see the poetry in the English as you would see in the Hebrew. But it's a, and there's a lot of uh, word plays and stuff like that. But that's what this literary genre of the book is. It's prophecy and poetic prophecy. And you also could say it's got some historical narrative, uh, not historical narrative, but sort of historical narrative, and that God in verses 10 through 14 through prophet Obadiah lists what Edom did to Judah in, the, in history. So in a way, it's kind of historical in that sense. So prophetic, we would call this book uh, Prophetic Prophecy. And that's the start of this introduction to the book of Obadiah. And uh, we'll pick this up next Sunday. Hope you enjoyed today's class. We have a lot to be, uh, God has a lot to teach us in this study of the book of Obadiah, as you can see from this past hour. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this morning. And we just pray, Father, that this lesson would help you people and that this study in the book of Obadiah will be a great blessing to the church, not only this local assembly, but the church uh, through in, in this country and around the world that hit our website and our other places that we find our st stuff being posted. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to do as, uh, we're going to have to take up our Sunday morning offering. And the congreg uh, no, we're not going to do a congregational song. We're going to do a song for the offering, which is The Love of God. It's on page 160. I sang this at Jody and Titus's wedding. How many years ago did you guys get married? I can't remember. Too long ago? Long time ago. Long time ago. How long have you been married, Bill? You and Crystal. All right. See, oh, you guys don't know how long you were married. 12 years? Cheyenne knows. The women know, you know why? Because they love the anniversary thing. Oh, yeah. Don't forget the anniversary of your wife. You're in tr with your wife, you're in trouble. So we're going to do the love of God as a, as a uh, song for the offering. Let's pray for this offering. Father, we pray that the, your people, by the power of the Spirit, will be moved to give in accordance to your word, in particular Galatians 6.6, 6, that those who are taught the word of God to share all good things with those who teach them. We pray that this uh, offering will be a blessing to your people because your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive, and that it would be resulting in uh, the recipient of this offering uh, rejoicing and thanking you, Father. And we just pray, Father, for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So this song is a song I sang at uh, Titus and Jody's wedding, and I... I do, of course, dedicate this to the love of God, to, to God, but my dear friends, Titus and Jody. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win his erring 
child He reconciled And burning from his Where thank the ocean fell And where the skies a parchment made Where every stalk on earth a quill And every man a scribe by trade To write the love I've got above what drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, the stretch from sky to sky.